Okay, let's get started. Thank you everyone for joining us today for today's CNCF webinar, Critical DevSecOps Considerations for Multi-Cloud Kubernetes. My name is Jerry Fallon and I will be moderating today's webinar. We would like to welcome our presenters today, Slavon Hugit, Senior Product Manager of Carbon and Cloud Native Solutions at Nutanix, and Loris Dijani, CTO and founder of Sysdig. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to drop your questions in there and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please, please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of the Code of Conduct. Please be respectful of your fellow participants and presenters. Please note that the recording and slides will, will be posted later today to the CNCF webinar page at cncf.io slash webinars. With that, I'll hand it over to our presenters for today's webinar. Thank you, thank you, Jerry. Um, and so let's get started. So yeah, my name is uh, Sylvain Huguet. I'm the, well, as Jerry said, the senior product manager at Nutanix working on Kubernetes and or uh, Kubernetes distribution, uh, namely carbon clusters. Um, I have a personal background more as an end user. It's probably my first time as a, in a software development world. So I come more from the technology uh, side of things, uh, more of the practitioner side. And today I have the great pleasure and honor to uh, co-present with uh, Loris uh, from Sysdig. So Loris, take it from there. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, my name is Loris De Giovanni. I'm CTO and founder uh, of uh, Sysdig. Sysdig is my second company. My first company was called Case Technologies and uh, was uh, the company behind uh, the Wireshark uh, network analyzer. So I've been in uh, open source uh, uh, and uh, um, security and visibility for essentially my whole career. Recently, I was also one of the people that uh, created Falco, which is uh, currently a CNCF incubating project. So um, I still enjoy being active with the community and in particular with uh, CNCF. Today, we're going to talk about uh, DevSecOps, we're going to talk about uh, security, we're going to talk about cloud native. Um, but uh, let's uh, start uh, by the high level trend, right? And the high level trend definitely is toward software. Software uh, is uh, becoming more and more important in every industry, every vertical, uh, every enterprise nowadays is an enterprise software. Definitely there are trends that are like uh, influencing the whole world, the whole planet, IoT, artificial intelligence, are examples uh, of these trends. And in every industry, even the more classical industries, even like brick and mortar uh, industries that have to do with the physical world, uh, nowadays software really is the, different, the, the differentiator and what determines the success or failure of uh, a company, of a business in the long term. And software is becoming more and more containers. Software is becoming more and more orchestrated, uh, modern microservice-based uh, applications. Let's talk about containers, uh, first of all. I've been following this industry essentially since the beginning, since when uh, uh, Docker uh, started the container uh, revolution uh, around six or seven years ago. And uh, it was very interesting to um, notice how containers initially were perceived just uh, as a light, lighter form, a more lightweight form of virtualization, right? So they were considered alternative to, uh, to virtual machines. They quickly, thanks to the fact that uh, the packaging of a container uh, is uh, uh, well known and uh, uh, transportable and can be used to run containers in multiple places, they quickly became the basis of uh, uh, continuous, uh, continuous integration of CI-CD. Uh, and uh, uh, really they sort of revolution the way we all do CI-CD. Uh, but the real 
power, the real value of containers comes from their ability to be the building block of uh, uh, orchestration and uh, therefore to be uh, in uh, conjunction with uh, modern orchestration frameworks like Kubernetes, really the uh, new paradigm in how we write uh, applications, how we deploy these applications, how we run these applications in productions, and just uh, essentially the new, the new uh, way of uh, writing software. Now, if we look at these uh, a little bit more from like the security point of view and from the ecosystem point of view, one of the things that uh, definitely I find the most exciting about uh, uh, containers is uh, uh, the ecosystem, especially if we look at the ecosystem around cloud native, around CNCF, uh, even just for security, we can see that uh, uh, there are a lot of powerful components that come essentially from the community. Uh, Istio for service mesh, tools like Falco that I'm personally involved with for uh, runtime uh, protection uh, of uh, um, containerized infrastructures and the ability to essentially detect threads and zero day vulnerabilities as your infrastructure is running and your applications are running on top of this infrastructure. Policies, uh, we're, we're like uh, centralized policies with uh, uh, open policy agents, OPA. Um, network policies uh, in conjunction with uh, networking frameworks like Calico for uh, um, just uh, networking and uh, in layer three uh, segmentation. Uh, image scanning uh, with Anchor and the all, you know, like CICD kind of protection. Uh, admission controllers to be able to, uh, uh, maybe in conjunction with tools like COPA to control uh, what goes in your cluster. And uh, uh, runtime uh, like filtering and protection like post security policies of uh, sec, sec profiles. These to me, looks like a, a really rich, powerful ecosystem that uh, has uh, uh, all of the components or most of the components that you are used to, you know, like uh, find from uh, essentially fragmented commercial vendors. Um, they, it's, it's essentially all in the same place and uh, all in the same ecosystem. And this is very powerful. The reason why Open is powerful, in, in, in my opinion, uh, or at least one of the reasons is that, uh, at this point, we can create consistencies, we can create mutual benefits, we can create harmonization uh, among these different tools and uh, make them essentially work together in a stack, which is very powerful. Uh, it means uh, less uh, vendor lock-in, but it also means much more value and much more innovation uh, in the ecosystem and, and for the final users. Also, this also, this means potentially more complexity, right? If you look at if we look at all of these pieces, uh, I was saying, you know, Falco is the one that I'm really involved with on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, deploying Falco is not easy. Uh, managing Falco is not easy uh, because uh, Kubernetes is not easy uh, and uh, orchestrating applications is not easy. So deploying Falco means that uh, you need to essentially to push this kind of uh, runtime protection on your whole cluster and uh, that, uh, and having it constantly running requires uh, uh, a decent amount of expertise. And this is just one of the components. So each, each of the components uh, like Istio or, or I don't know, uh, OPA require a certain, certain amount of skills and uh, just making them work together uh, requires a non-negligible uh, amount of, of, of context. From this point of view, when we're talking about complexity, uh, typically uh, one metaphor that uh, people have used for cloud is uh, the metaphor of uh, pets and cattle, right? Traditionally, before the cloud, before virtualization, uh, before uh, things like, uh, I don't know, AWS, we uh, used to uh, treat our servers as pets. Each of them was special to us. Uh, each of them uh, deserved uh, our focus and our care. Each of them, uh, we needed to uh, make sure uh, it was healthy and uh, uh, that uh, it was happy. <laughs> and then cloud came. And in cloud, essentially, we don't, we don't worry too much 
about the single is instance anymore. Typically, we have many of them behind the load balancer. Uh, they, you know, they can grow, they can decrease, and uh, we try to design our infrastructure so that uh, uh, we don't care about the single one, but we care about them as a group. And this is a well-known metaphor. I didn't invent it. You know what I think is that uh, we are the next uh, iteration of this metaphor. Now we are going from cattle to locusts. Why? Because uh, now our entity of, uh, of computing, our unit for our applications, for our services, is um, the container. Containers are small. They uh, can move from one place to another pretty fast because there's an orchestrator like Kubernetes that can take them and, they, and, and can just uh, essentially move them to different places or reorganize them based on the workload and uh, generate a quick expansion or reduction in the number of containers. Uh, there's many of them. It's harder to keep track of them. Uh, they uh, not only uh, uh, cannot uh, be uh, approached on a one by, by one basis, but it's almost like counterproductive. And by the way, if you are not careful <laughs> about what you do with them, they can be very dangerous <laughs> and, you can, and, and, and you, you can get in trouble. So welcome to the uh, era of locusts. And uh, of course, as we move to locusts, there are problems that we have to solve, right? It's harder to understand what locusts do, uh, and it's definitely potentially harder to secure them. Uh, again, if we go back to the world of pets, this is my very artistic representation of the classic, uh, you know, like multi tier application, right? You can have a cache in front of a web server that then talks to the database that uh, stores the state, right? Nothing, nothing magic here. Nowadays, the same uh, architecture looks a little bit more like uh, something like uh, what we have in this slide. Uh, here we have multiple computing nodes. So each gray box here in this slide is, uh, is a node, typically a piece of uh, a physical hardware that is running our containers or a virtual machine or a cloud instance. You know, this is a sort of, uh, uh, it, 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 it doesn't really matter too much. And then we have, uh, you know, containers running uh, on top of these nodes. And uh, for simplicity, I put four containers in each node and I color uh, coded them uh, in based on the service they belong to, you know, before we had uh, like uh, the database uh, server and uh, the web server and so on. Now we typically have uh, um, services, uh, deployments that sit, uh, you know, behind uh, uh, like a load balancer or DNS names, and uh, they are implemented by multiple containers that work together to implement those services. And then, of course, uh, uh, these can uh, talk to each other in arbitrary ways. So it's pretty clear, you know, by just uh, flipping the slides and compare these two pictures, where the challenges and the complexity come from. Complexities and challenges also require and involve approaching these with a new mindset. One thing that uh, uh, is pretty clear is that it's not only a matter of uh, uh, just uh, having containers and having Kubernetes and having orchestration and having microservices, uh, but uh, the whole stack, the whole ecosystem needs to evolve not only in terms of new functionality, like in the slide before where, where I was showing the new projects, you know, that are part of the ecosystem, but each of these projects are here, you know, because each of these projects are a way of uh, uh, rethinking, reimagining a core piece of functionality that was implemented in a certain way and just need to be rethought with a blank sheet of paper when you go from this model to this model. Otherwise, it won't work. Segmentation, uh, like uh, your traditional firewall that was, you know, you were putting it uh, in three or four pieces before. Now uh, you need to just think about uh, how you do it, you know, and that's how, uh, yeah, tools like, for example, Calico or, or service meshes and so on uh, are appearing for us. Um, runtime security. Again, I, I work on Falco. So that was uh, when I started Falco, I was inspired by the a previous generation of tools, like, for example, Snort, uh, like SC Linux and so on. But uh, it was pretty clear 
that uh, uh, it was impossible to apply these tools in a natural way to the world of locusts. And that's essentially why we started Falco and that's why we're working on it and, and we're really taking a different approach with Falco. Containers uh, in particular have the additional uh, challenge that um, uh, they tend to be uh, like more isolated, which is great, but also uh, a little bit more opaque and challenging in terms of visibility, right? So uh, not only we have a new paradigm, but we also have a new paradigm that from one point of view uh, provides better independence and isolation and structure in our applications, but at the same time uh, creates challenges in terms of visibility. And because of these challenges, very often people say uh, containers are less secure. So one of the drawbacks of containers, one of the drawbacks of, uh, of uh, uh, the new cloud paradigm is that uh, they uh, are less secure than our previous generation of applications. Well, I argue it's the opposite. Uh, it's uh, actually containers and Kubernetes are more secure, for sure. They're way more secure. It's a, it's a matter of uh, managing the complexity, managing the different pieces and components that I was mentioning before, and architecting them together in a stack that covers the life cycle. In particular, when looking at the security for Kubernetes, and security for cloud native, and security for containers, I like to approach these with uh, uh, a three tier approach build, run, and respond. Build is the CI CD phase of uh, uh, building and creating and bringing to production uh, cloud native applications. And uh, uh, building means essentially going from the code, the editor of a, of, of a developer that creates, uh, you know, the, the components of an application to essentially uh, uh, bringing that application to the production uh, stage and to run it uh, in, the, in, the, in the production environment. During build, we want to make sure that early on, we take advantage of the shift left in security. In particular, uh, it's important to take care of uh, scanning vulnerabilities, uh, scanning our code, scanning container images, and essentially being able to block, you know, at, at different places uh, in the CICD, um, uh, the application that con when it contains issues and security uh, concerns, and being able to give the proper feedback to the developers so that uh, their workflow is helped by this and not hampered uh, by, by this. The application then goes into runtime and here essentially it's running and it's uh, runtime is the place uh, where the application delivers essentially the value to the users, but it's also subject to attacks from the external world. So runtime security is very important. Tools like Falco uh, are, are very important here to essentially being able to detect and protect um, applications as they run. Segmentation and micro segmentation uh, is very important in this phase. Vulnerability reporting, security monitoring, which is a new area, uh, is, uh, is, is extremely important as well because it's part of a feedback loop that uh, allows essentially to maintain and manage the application as it, as it runs, but also to inform essentially the stages of uh, the CI-CD pipeline. A very important area that is very often forgotten when crafting the proper uh, approach to uh, container security is the respond area. This is uh, one of the areas that changes the most with uh, uh, containerization and with Kubernetes because uh, traditionally, you know, uh, incident response, forensics, auditing, and this kind of stuff was done by uh, instrumenting and adding components to each of our computing units, like when, uh, right, when the unit, unit was, was a, is the host or the virtual machine, you have a full operating system running on, the, on these uh, entities. And uh, uh, if something happens, essentially very often what you do is you SSH into this unit and you can start essentially your, your, your forensics. You can start understanding the blessed radius of something that happened. How do you do that with a, with a container? First of all, 
by the time you receive a red light that something has been detected by the green runtime part, uh, your uh, stuff is pretty much, your container is gone, you know? And even if it's still there, uh, if containers are designed to be minimal and very small, right? So you don't have inside it the tools that you need. So approaching in the proper way, the respond phase is definitely part of the stack and it's one of the important ways to make containers more secure. And of course, then there's compliance, which spans essentially everything, because when you want to be compliant, PCI, you know, we are all delivering SaaS applications nowadays, and our users are demanding that their data is safe, that, uh, that our applications are compliant. When you do that, essentially, that needs to span build, run, and respond. Uh, so that's how I approach this. And uh, yes, Ivan, I would, I would love to see, you know, your perspective and your point of view on this. Thank you, Laurie. So yeah, I, the, I, I like this approach. It's essentially, um, as you said, it's securing end-to-end -end the life cycle of the application. You absolutely uh, have to look at every single step of the life cycle of this application from the moment it's thought of from the developers all the way to going to the IT operation and operationalizing that application. So going from dev to production, and you need to make it secure, which ties us back to our, our, our theme, which is dev, sec, ops. We need to have all those three components working together. Um, and in your uh, environment, in your uh, slide, there's one thing that I like uh, is focusing on runtime, because guess what? All of the tools that you mentioned whether it's your CI CD pipeline, your, your registry, your alerting, your responding, all of those things are themselves application. All of them have their own life cycle. All of them are sitting on some pieces of infrastructure somewhere. So I'm going to give all of you guys that are attending and, and yourself, uh, Loris as well, the benefit of the doubt and say that you know all of that. And I know you know all of that, Loris. So you've probably secured all of your application very well. My question to you is, if you only secure the top of your stack, that application, how secure is the whole stack? And what I mean by that is the rest of that stack, the infrastructure behind it, the storage, the who, who is running that stack, because as we all know, the security that or of our application is only as effective as its weakest link. And so if you've done your homework, if you've put your application in the most secure possible way out in the world, but the team responsible to own and operate that application isn't following those same practices, is that can be a real issue, right? So my answer is, the locust, I love that uh, analogy, but I think there's one element on this earth that can do even more damage, and that's a human. So I'm, I'm really sorry, but the human error can be even worse than any swarm of locusts. We have tons of examples. I mean, uh, if you open any of the websites and, and specialized uh, news these days, and even some of the just popular news uh, media, all of them have uh, example of human errors that caused cascades of uh, issues that caused uh, a lot of um, uh, lost revenue, maybe even loss of life. We just had a, a, re, a recent example uh, today with a ransomware that did a lot of damage and even killed someone. I mean, we don't want to be in those situations. So you need to consider the whole stack. And even if you secure your application, the human can always be an, a, a problem. And the reason being, most of you know that. And what I'm saying is, is probably just uh, evidence for a lot of you guys, but it's in infrastructure world, in most enterprise infrastructure world, there is still a lot of human involved. There's still a lot of repetitive tasks. And what happens, we all know that as apps developers, as DevOps guys, we've learned that. What happens when you have a lot of repetitive tasks? It gets boring very quickly. And what does a human brain do when it gets boring? It creates errors. It's unwillingly making errors in creating and in doing those, tech, those uh, tasks. So if you have perfectly automated the top of your stack, 
but your infrastructure isn't up to par, then you are probably sitting, setting yourself up for a, a disaster in the future. And so let's take a deep look at the security down the stack, which is the next slide on, on that deck. Do you, can you make your platform uh, more secure? I believe you can. And you can by treating essentially your uh, infrastructure more or less like you would treat any other application. So I'm just stating the obvious here. Many of you, most of you probably are already using uh, tools like uh, Chef, Puppet, Ansible, whatever is uh, your automation tool of, of choice. However, that's uh, something that maybe your infrastructure guys are using for your apps, but not for everything. Did you even have that conversation with them? Because again, if your infrastructure is not secure, the blast radius of having, for example, a gaping hole in your virtualization management plane, it means that your app is very secure in your VM, but the bad guy already is seeing all of your VM, including yours. So there's right there is the problem. Um, there's also a way of, uh, as uh, Loris mentioned, public cloud providers have evolved a lot or way of consuming infrastructure. So sometimes falsely, we think that by going with a public cloud provider with AWS or Azure or GCP or whomever, we are secure by default. No, you're not. All those guys, what they do is they provide you infrastructure at your own risk. It doesn't replace and it doesn't cover any of the risk that you're taking by running those applications. If anything, and that's more of a um, personal uh, opinion on that, if anything, you give up a lot of control on that infrastructure, which means that you don't necessarily have the tools available to you to run those checks, to run those audits, to make sure that your infrastructure uh, elements are um, correctly configured. But the reality is, as much as I would love to say everybody is using and consuming infrastructure as cloud, in enterprise world, that's far from being the reality. Most enterprises out there are still using traditional storage, networking, virtualization, the so-called three-tier uh, infrastructure stack. Um, and all of those things usually are silos. And what happens if one of those silos is compromised? then the whole stack is compromised. So the next slide talks a bit about the uh, security through the cloud native, throughout your cloud native uh, journey. One element, one very key element in the DevSecOps um, trio is the security team. Dev and Ops guys, these days we've learned to try and work together. We've patch things up sometimes with more or less uh, success, but we've, and I, I come from the IT ops. I have 10 years in that industry in financial sector. So it's, it's something that's very close to, to me. And I trained as a developer. And so I was doing something like DevOps for years, even before that train came in. And so for me, it was, a, it was just business as usual, but I sort of opened my eyes to the fact that that's not how people are doing it. And so I'm very happy to see that Dev and Ops have now starting to have that discussion and that uh, coherence of their action. But there's a third party in that relationship in the Dev Sec Ops, it's the security team. And for better or worse, in many enterprise that I'm involved with and I talk to, I realized very quickly that even if the dev and ops team have sort of bonded together, usually they've bonded together against that third, that third team. And if you dive into that, why is that? It's because they don't speak the same language, but they have the same need. The security team, if you just listen for a few minutes and you translate their concern, you'll see that they are very, very close to what we call now this DevOps mentality. So for example, the security team will come with this uh, question of, I want auditability. And Loris covered that very well. 
in the dev the world of, of DevOps, like with containers being ephemeral, how do you audit what's happening? So you need those tools, you need those those accountability, and you guys already have that. It's just a matter of exposing that to that security team. They don't want to look over your shoulder to everything you do, you do, but they have their own accountability of those things. They usually want to see automation because automation means it's reproducible. They can know how from the get-go what's going to happen. They want those logs. They want the automation. Guess what? Your tools are already doing that. It's just you're not using the same language as the security team. Next thing that they want, they want simple processes. Why? Remember that human error story? If you have complex processes, if you have complexity in your stack, Loris explained that very well uh, at the beginning of uh, having added complexity by adding a lot of tools that require a lot of uh, knowledge, specialized knowledge around that. That's something that a security team gets scared of because then there's a scarcity of skills. There's specialized skills that may or may not be there when you need it to audit something or something like that. So instead of those things, by having microservices, something that we know in the DevOps world and in this cloud native world to be the unit of uh, computing that we, we practice, a microservices does one thing and one thing only so it's very simple. It's as simple as it can be. The rest, the tools around it are automating that, are automating those processes. So it's not human. But if we need to, we can go and look at what this process is doing. The third pillar of security team is they want no disruption. And what I mean by no disruption is no disruption to the business. They are accountable for the business. So if there's any breach, if there's any downtime, they get called because that's their responsibility. They, they are the first responder for that in many cases these days. And so by having non-disruptive Kubernetes and uh, operating system upgrades and infrastructure upgrades, by having a real modern infrastructure stack that you can treat as an app, it means that you can provide that level of uh, compliance and discussion with those SEC teams and really start embedding them into those dev sec ops trio. The next part is around essentially the same idea of security through the cloud native journey. If you start bringing together those ops, those dev, and as we saw, those security practitioners, if you start bringing all of those people together then you start realizing that we look for the same thing and we are just talking about it um, differently. So don't fear your security team. Don't push them away. Try and bring them with you, especially because if, as we'll see on that last slide, and I, I promise I'm stopping there, um, that the, the next step on that cloud native journey is the security when it comes to multi-cloud. Most of you are probably already consuming at least one cloud provider or some form of infrastructure in your uh, environment. The next logical piece that everybody is anticipating is that you'll start consuming multiple pieces of infrastructure and tying those together and weaving them together. But if it was already complex to secure one infrastructure, think about, oh, those things, the same complexity diagram that Loris was showing for an app and those containers interacting between compute nodes, you start to have the same thing at a macro level between clouds, between cloud providers, between infrastructures, between technologies that drive your infrastructure. So you're adding a lot of complexity even before you start starting the first app. And so what if instead of having those layers upon layers upon layers of complexity, what if your infrastructure was an app like any other? How would you go about securing your app in that environment? That's my question to you guys. That's my send off and your homework, if you want, uh, around that. It's 
really think about how you're going to secure that and build together that DevSecOps team because that's the way forward. Do we have any questions? Thank you both for a wonderful presentation. Um, as we stated earlier, as always, uh, please feel free to drop in questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. Do you want to add anything, Loris, to? Um, no, I mean, just uh, uh, essentially just, just as, a, as a wrap up, uh, it really feels like uh, uh, the right approach involves, uh, uh, I, I was uh, showing right to left, right? Uh, and from one point of view, uh, going into the build phase by shifting left, but also being able to take care of runtime and uh, the respond, respond phase. But it's uh, almost uh, uh, a bi-dimensional chart here, right? Because it's right to left, but it's also up and down in our stack, right? Because each of the components that are in the left to right, uh, then are based on a stack that is, as you were saying here, you know, can, can be on-prem, uh, can be in the cloud, but more often is in, uh, uh, is and will be more and more in a combination of different multiple places. So uh, there's no right and left security if the underlying foundation is, uh, is, is, is not secure enough. So the right approach really feels like a, a combination of making sure and focus uh, when, when protecting applications in, in, in the two dimensions of a two dimensional chart. Absolutely. Um, I see one question coming up. Uh, so the question, and I really read it out loud, is what do you feel about security of cloud infrastructure moving towards on-prem? Example, Azure Arc or AWS Outpost? Um, so I can take that one it, if you want. But. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I will uh, let you, you know, answer that. Just uh, clearly, this uh, is a trend that I see more and more, just uh, the approach uh, of um, cloud vendors of starting essentially offering uh, or Google Antos, you know, all of these uh, yeah. uh, start, start offering essentially a consistent or trying to offer a consistent experience uh, from uh, that, that spans uh, from the traditional cloud and goes more into the, the data center. This is uh, like a, definitely a business uh, kind uh, of, uh, of, of trend for the cloud providers. Clearly, you know, as cloud grows, uh, the data center remains important and uh, the uh, uh, competition in the data center becomes uh, a very important factor in the competition. So uh, business-wise, this makes sense, but I feel like uh, uh, at least conceptually, it makes sense also architecture-wise because uh, uh, bringing consistency uh, definitely allows to uh, create better infrastructures. And from the security point of view, which is the angle we come from, definitely consistency helps security, right? Now, the Absolutely. question is, uh, uh, I, I find the two, trend, uh, two trends that are a little bit competing. One is this one, and the other one is uh, what we have on the slide, which is uh, uh, segmentation and fragmentation of clouds and with the uh, increased competitiveness of clouds, you uh, ve very often want to look at uh, uh, operating in multiple clouds Absolutely. because of financial considerations, because of technical considerations, because there's a service that is very strong in Google Cloud and another one that is very strong in Azure and, and so on. So this is sort of an orthogonal uh, trend. And uh, this to me speaks more to having, you know, a, pro a proper abstraction layer that allows you to run stuff, uh, everything. So one trend is uh, take one of these and bring them in, in, in your own data center. There are benefits related to that. Another trend is like ignore this layer and, and think at a slightly higher layer uh, and, and make Kubernetes the common language, you know, 
and make containers in the Docker format, the common execution format, and then you can you can maybe abstract and and you and maybe you don't care too much what's running here, which trend is better and which one will win in the long term. Uh, I'm still not completely sure about because they they both have valid uh, values that they're bringing to the table. And Sylvain, feel, feel free to to add your thoughts here. Absolutely. So I agree with everything you you said. I would just want to add one uh, dimension that we haven't mentioned because we focused more on the on the technical aspect of of security. Uh, the other aspect of security is the legal one. It's the uh, the the laws of the states of the, the governance of data, that kind of 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 uh, aspect. Who are too often ignored by developers and more of a, a, a consideration or preoccupation from the security guys who have uh, oftentimes uh, their, who, who he would, sorry, uh, from whom this is the, the job to, to make sure they're abiding by all those laws. And so to get back to the question of security of cloud infrastructure moving toward on-prem, I believe one aspect uh, outside of the obvious business uh, angle uh, that you mentioned is this uh, notion of sovereignty of data of where is my data, where is my app, um, who has access to it, what can those person do with it. And again, it goes to not only the human error, but the human oversight of who has access to those data. And so um, I don't know if you're in Switzerland, for example, you may not want your data to be uh, accessible by uh, someone else. You may wanna be the Switzerland of data. It might be your new way of storing, after storing money in banks, you may wanna store data in data vaults and have sovereignty over that. So uh, the, the trend from and I, I believe the trend is is also the same we've seen in this industry for much longer than cloud. Um, we started with very centralized monolithic system where everything was in one place. And then we moved to micro PC and open and the world of x86 with distributed computing everywhere. And then we started to have cloud providers where once again, all the resources, all the computes that many of us are using was once again getting very quickly centralized in a very single uh, places, or at least in the very few umbrellas. And now we see the, the cycle starts expanding again. We are, we are seeing the trend of those compute going back out because, for example, in the list of, of uh, use cases that you mentioned at the very beginning, for IT, for uh, IoT, for AI, you don't necessarily want or have the luxury of going all the way to a cloud. So having those, the way of consuming a cloud very locally um, and having a cloud-like feeling of an experience, but getting that on premise and being able to apply the same treatment. And as you, as you very rightly said, being able to abstract the differences of where those infrastructure are sitting is, I believe, uh, a very integral part of making your infrastructure more secure. Do we have other questions? Jerry. Do we have any questions? Still waiting at this moment. Everyone okay. feel free to leave your questions in the Q&A box. We'll get to as many as we can. We have 10 more minutes.
Anyone at all? Don't be shy. We're here. <laughs> what are the best multi-cloud tools to move from one public cloud to another with prop with a proper ugh, with a proper security audit? Um. So, uh, and again, uh, Sylvain, I don't know if you uh, want, want to want to start with this one. Otherwise, I will give. I can. A, I I can give it, give you my Sorry. quick shot on, on that. Um, tools to do multi-cloud while uh, providing proper security audit. I think in this day and age, you need to have, you need to, to remember a few things and we'll go back to the technical side for, for once. All those cloud providers have different format. So when you are talking about, for example, just moving data, is already a challenge. You need a tool that you're going to be able to convert from, let's say, AMI to um, uh, whatever uh, to whatever storage um, your destination um, infrastructure use. So, for example, I don't know, VMDK or whatever. So, you need already there's some complexity in that. Whatever you choose, you need to make it an automated tool. So if the tool doesn't provide that automation, because we are DevOps and because we are now taking a DevOps approach to infrastructure, and as I said, we're considering infrastructure as an app like any other, all those tools that we use that provide uh, those kind of, of security, I mean, shameless plug for Nutanix on that, we have a tool called Move who does just that. Um, so we have, for example, that, that capability, we have orchestrated that, but we do it in a way where every single action that is taken from um, cloning a disk to converting it to um, powering down the machine or everything like that, everything is audited. So you get a trace of every single action, who does what at what time and every single action that has been taken. However, what you do not want to do is reintroduce the human factor into the equation. So you need to build that automation. And the reality is when it comes to infrastructure, it's still a, a, an area that's very lacking in terms of automated tools for a lot of those actions. And there's still a lot of um, development and a lot of movement in that area. Not necessarily as much as I wish there would be um, because I see the developer sides of the house getting all the new shiny toys and they get all that automation but the infra guys are left wanting and so there is opportunities for that so companies like myself uh, with Nutanix um, we have as I said tools that can do that and pretty much every vendor cloud vendor as at least a tool to get you in the issue is how do you go out and that's also something you need to realize especially in that multi-cloud era that we were mentioning at the end so loris you probably have something to add no i just i just uh, i agree with you i just want to add uh, a thought that uh, might seem trivial uh, but uh, it's not completely trivial, which is if you want to be multi-cloud uh, and uh, at the same time uh, have good consistency for security, use Kubernetes. Uh, and uh, um, when you use Kubernetes, if you remember, let me share this slide, right? Um, with the tools in this slide, uh, the stack, we were talking about the, 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 the in my part of the presentation, I was talking about the stack, you know, and, and the fact that the stack is open. When you use Kubernetes, you are essentially guaranteed that, that the projects that you're reading uh, on this slide will be supported actively by every cloud provider. You are guaranteed that the cloud providers will not only make sure they are well integrated, but they will probably be active contributors to same of these, uh, to, uh, to, to several of these. Again, I come from Falco, 
uh, I'm active in the ecosystem. We're constantly working with cloud providers. Uh, to give you uh, an, an example, just, uh, just yesterday, uh, we have a working group essentially to have Palco uh, uh, support uh, uh, Fargate, you know, in, uh, in AWS, which is an interesting environment. And uh, uh, we're working together with, uh, with, with Amazon to get the best possible experience to, to our users. So the beauty of the Kubernetes stack, and the reason why I very often con uh, use uh, operating system of the cloud to, desc to describe Kubernetes, is that uh, uh, it's an opinionated way to run your applications in a way that uh, you can do in your data center, you can do it completely by yourself, or you can do with different degrees of essentially support from the cloud provider. So uh, instead of um, mentioning, you know, something specific uh, or, 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 or specific, you know, like approaches or use, use cases or vendors, uh, uh, I just give the generic answer, but there's, there's more, uh, you know, depth into, the, into this answer than just use Kubernetes than, than what it would seem. essentially put the proper abstraction layer in place. Pretty much, use the proper operating system. <laughs> okay, I think we have time for one more question. So if anybody wants to get in a last minute question, now's the time to do so. Anyone at all? No takers. Okay, well, if you don't have any takers, we'll wrap up today's webinar. I want to thank our presenters today for a wonderful presentation. Thank you all for attending. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you, Loris. Thank have you. Have a good weekend. You as well. Bye.